All right, we're rolling. Hello, everyone. My name is Jordan Duran. I'm the host of Changing the Game. Changing the Game was created to share leadership insights and inspiration from female professionals who are out there making a difference in their industry. Today, I'm joined by Casey Bellamy. Casey is a US Olympic gold medalist in ice hockey, a nine-time world champion, and a three-time Olympian. She is currently a director of athletic development at Maples Crossing, a mindset coach at Women's Hockey Life, and a color commentator for women's hockey at the University of New Hampshire. Welcome, Casey. Thanks for having me. Very excited. Me too. I'm so excited to have you. I needed to take a breath after all those amazing accolades. So I'm, I'm so excited for you to get into it and share your experience with the guests. Um, so I guess we could just get right into it. I'd love if you could kick us off. Tell us about your journey to becoming a Division I athlete. What was your life like growing up? Yeah. Uh long um definitely <laughs> definitely helped because my brother was playing um so i grew up with three other siblings two brothers and a sister and my two brothers and i played hockey but my older brother played right away and literally just went down to the basement one day threw on all his stinky equipment and told my parents that i wanted to play hockey uh and back in the 90s wasn't really a, a girl sport but um it didn't really matter to me i knew nothing different and my mom was very supportive. My dad said, nope, absolutely not. Hockey's not for girls. Uh, but I think over time, obviously, he changed his mind. And um, yeah, I started playing hockey at five years old, uh, prominently boys, um, all the way up until I was 13, 14. So a lot of challenges along that way, a lot of adversity being faced, um, but learned a lot. I think that's where I definitely got my uh, thick skin. And then around that 13, 14, I had to make a decision, uh, high school, wh what am I going to do? Am I going to continue to play boys hockey? But I had this unbelievable opportunity to go to uh, boarding school. Um, and so I left home at 14 uh, and went and stayed at Berkshire School for four years, which was the most amazing experience probably of, of my life besides the Olympics, just because it grew me as a person as a hockey player as an athlete um met so many amazing people that i still keep in touch with but that's when i kind of knew okay i think i'm pretty good at this sport and i used those you know four years to prepare me the best that i could to um get into a college and i kind of based it off of three colleges st lawrence unh and providence college just i wanted to stay around kind of the new england area slash a lot of berkshire girls went to st lawrence um, but I ultimately made my decision to go to UNH, um, and it was an incredible. I think the coach there helped me so much in my development as a hockey player and then ended up on Team USA my sophomore year. That's an incredible story. Starting from, you know, not, hey, girls don't play hockey. I think that mentality, I hope, is changing. And I, I've actually experienced that myself when I was younger. I wanted to play hockey, being from Minnesota, and my parents really? were like, oh, yeah. Oh, my parents were, we, they had lived in Missouri before that. Like hockey was unheard of. They were like, well, girls playing hockey. What is this? That, so I know. that was really cool that you experienced that. And then you were able to play with the boys. I want to know too, what your life was like in boarding school. I feel like that's a, an infamiliar area for a lot of people. Yeah, definitely. And it, it is now, I think it's a little foreign, um, now but back then if you were a female i think that that was the avenue that a lot of us took um boys right. were getting too big a lot of us played boys so going to prep school was amazing just because i was able to actually play with females now and i knew that i was going to be able to do that the rest of my career hopefully um but it wasn't just hockey for me it was kind of everything else which just prepared me for life um, i wasn't very strong academically but it was kind of the foundation of my work ethic, my leadership, uh, my personality, um, you know, my authenticity. So wonderful experience. And if any parent asks me uh, the route to go, I would definitely say boarding school for sure. Is that route becoming less common with girls high school hockey picking up in, in the public school area? Or is it still pretty a pretty common option? I think it depends on your family and how you're brought up, but now definitely so many more options for girls, right? There's junior teams, there's youth teams all over now, where when I was, you know, playing hockey, I had to drive two hours if I wanted to play girls and my parents just wouldn't be able to handle that type of commitment. Um, but now 
you, you can see girls programs 10 minutes down the street, wherever you live. So that's just the, the amazing growth of women's hockey over the last 20 years. Yeah, I, I think that's amazing that the representation for women's sports is creating so much. I want to touch a little bit on too. Your, you mentioned that your coach was really instrumental in your development in college. Um, how did that relationship help you develop over time and, and help you get to that next level in your professional career? Yeah, you know, when I played hockey, I didn't really think about the positioning or the tactical or technical side of the game as much as when I really, you know, stepped on the ice at UNH. Um, I think when I was at Berkshire, my coach was an unbelievable coach there, but she instilled that work ethic and character in me. And so when I, you know, was able to get to UNH, I was like, wow, okay, there's all these, you know, different ways to speak about the game, defensive positioning, um, how to be on the blue line, uh, you know, in the offensive zone, defensive zone, stick positioning, um, just angling, all these technical words and the things that I didn't even think about when I was in high school. But, you know, you have to fine tune those things once you hit that top level on the national team. So he was just an incredible coach, coach men's hockey on the, the UNH side, went to Dartmouth. So I very much lucked out with him. That's awesome. Can you talk about your your transition then from, or I guess, you know, you you started competing professionally while you were in college. So can you talk about that transition or that journey a little bit? Yeah. So my first ever invite to the national team was, you know, in between my freshman and sophomore year. And that was my first ever invitation to Team USA. Um, and ironically, I was cut from that team. Um, so it was obviously pure excitement going to Lake Placid, stepping on the ice with the best females in the country. Um, but then my dream was kind of shattered in that moment. And it was a very big turning point for me because I think as athletes, as human beings, when you get denied something that you work so hard for, you know, you can blame people, you know, you can point fingers or think I'm better than them. The coach has no idea what they're talking about, but it just wasn't the way that we were brought up as kids. Right. So, you know, I took a big, hard look in the mirror and I said, what do I need to do to get better? Um, because that was my goal and nothing was going to stop me. So I got the courage up and emailed the coach about two weeks later to ask her uh, what I needed to do and why I didn't make the team. And she gave me like five bullet points. And I remember them to this day, um, you know, affected by others, needs to work on her release, needs to work on, you know, your footwork, um, you know, simple things. But the one that hit me the most was affected by others, because that means she, uh, you know, judged me and my character without really even knowing me. So it was definitely a spark um, and a fire that was built under me kind of from there on out. And two weeks now, maybe two months later, I, I got the call that I made uh, the Four Nations tournament for Team USA, and that was the senior team. Um, and ever since then, 2007, I was never cut again. That is such a cool story. Having the courage to ask for that feedback, that can be really scary because it puts you in such a vulnerable position. I think yeah, definitely. Here at Shift, I work with, with athletes and veterans who are transitioning to their next career after their athletic or military career inevitably ends. And I think that is huge when you're trying to develop your skills, having to ask for feedback, even when it's something that it's like, wow, I really didn't want to hear that. Or, hey, I totally disagree with you on that. But somebody else's perception can be the reality. And it affected you in that moment. Yeah. And yeah. It was definitely humbling. Um, you know, you like I said, you work so hard for something and you think you have your trajectory just, you know, on point throughout your entire life. And then in instance, you know, it can just, you know, be done. But I, I think in anything in life, it's how you respond to those challenges and everything's a mindset, right? It's how you look at it. It's how you respond. And then it's how you take action afterwards. That's all. Yeah. Attitude is everything. I'm 100% with you there. Um, I want to hear a little bit more about your your journey on the USA team, your professional career. Can you walk us through what that was like in, in your journey there and while you were in it? Yeah, so obviously Team USA was an incredible experience. Um, I've been retired now for three years, so it seems like forever ago. But, um, you know, after my first Olympics, 2010, it was kind of that perfect timing. I graduated from UNH, went right into my centralization year with uh, Team USA 
went to the Olympics, dream come true. Um, and then we lost, right? So definitely um, a positive, but bittersweet, right? So yeah. right after that loss, um, I had to make a decision where to play next, right? We didn't really have any options around where I was living in Boston, but um, there was a women's professional league at that time, the CWHL, they created a team out of Boston. Um, and I went and played for that team. And I, I trained uh, with Mike Boyle with all of my teammates around that area. And it was a great experience. We didn't get paid any money, obviously. But, um, you know, for the, the the small amount of money that we did get paid from USA Hockey, I made it work. And I think back then, like looking at it, you had no choice, right? Um, if you're if you're playing and training, you have to go at it 100 percent and you have to make do with what you have. So I have no regrets at that. But, you know, we tried to build the sport and that's what we were doing. Right. The pioneers of the sport, you would say, yeah. um, because look where it is now. It's that's incredible. Would you say I was and that's what I was going to ask you, actually. So look where it is now. Would you say that that has changed then? I mean, you are women's hockey players able to make a living wage when they're playing professionally yeah. now, there's still a fight yeah i would say now it's it's getting there but it's nowhere near where men's professional right. sports are like um there's a new league that just started this year and it's it's been phenomenal i've watched it um it seems like it's growing at a great great pace the media attention towards it has been incredible um but i think the smart thing with them is that they had a bargaining agreement and the salaries are kind of set for, you know, the next couple of years where, you know, that top tier gets paid this amount and then, you know, so on and so forth. I think the bottom tier that, that money needs to, to come up because I think at 35 to $40,000, it's not a livable wage unless, you know, you're getting more per diem slash housing paid for car paid for, but let's just hope it's going in the right direction where, you know, all of these, you know, female hockey players are able to just play and not have to work and, you know, make that wage um, throughout their professional careers. Yeah, I, I hope so too. And, and on this note, I do want to talk about your experience. You had to fight for more equity and support in 2017. So can you share a little bit more about this experience and, and what lessons you've taken from it? Yeah, for sure. I mean, listen, when I was on the national team, I made a clear cut $2,000, not taxed yet a month for at this time. So seven years. Um, and it was not easy, right? I was living in Boston. The rent was high. I had to eat the best food I could. And that means I had probably had to, you know, spend a little more money on that. Um, had to spend money on massage and you know, training supplies because I wanted to be the best. But um, I was texting my mom, you have to transfer money to me. And as soon as our check comes in, because at that time, our check wouldn't come in on the first of the month. It was either the 8th or the 15th. And I was like, this just isn't how a professional athlete should be treated playing at the highest level. And I think a lot of our teammates at that time thought the same thing. And, you know, the, the women's national team tried to do this um, back in the 2000s. And, you know, I heard the problem there was not everybody was united. Um, but luckily for our team, we had about 12 to 13 veterans that had kind of been together from the start. And it was just what we needed. Um, and so we had a lot of conversations, you know, with our lawyers and we were going to do this. And so... Mm -hmm. We had world championships in the U.S. at that time, and, you know, we were going to boycott those world championships uh, to fight for what we deserved and what was, to be honest, right. And it was a lot of work, um, a lot of, you know, challenges along the way, uh, but we had to be patient and call every single women's hockey college player, coach, um, D3, because they wanted to replace us and they would have done yeah. whatever they to get another team there. Um, but we stood, stood strong. And, um, you know, at that last hour, uh, we did it and we were able to get to the world championships like three days before and, uh, we crushed it. It was, it was an amazing experience and it wasn't just about the hockey, right? It was just about being united, um, and sticking together. And, uh, it was really meaningful for us and it, you know, trans translated into the next Olympics. That is that's like a goosebump story that is so cool that you were able to rally together and yes win 
and also have the victory of being united and and getting some agreement to your terms. I I heard you on Keller and Kessel's podcast talk this story, and you had mentioned uh, that unity again that you felt with the team, and you were able to get everyone board to boycott. Um, mm-hmm. How were you able to do that truly when you have rookie players on the team who it's their it's their first time playing at this level or just how are you able to create that sense of unity and get everyone on on board? Yeah, I mean, you have to have that trust, right? And that leadership quality of, you know, we have to do this. And trust me, it's going to benefit not just us, but the people generations from now. And um, if I was in that, those players' shoes and it was my first world championship, I, I wouldn't have known what I would have done either at that time, because it's such a important pivotal moment in your career when you finally get a chance to put on that USA Jersey. And now it's like, Oh, I might not be able to do that. Very tough. But I think when you have a belief in your leadership and you have a belief in that common goal, um, you know, you kind of have to take a step back and, you know, not be selfish and kind of look at it as a whole, not just the whole women's hockey, but women's sports in general and look, look at where, you know, we've come from that 2017 moment. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Believing in your leadership and being able to just trust the process. That's huge. Yep. Yeah. I want to hear a little bit more about your Olympic experience too. Um, Olympic gold medalist, obviously Olympics are top of mind for everyone right now. I know it's summer Olympics, but Mm -hmm. I, I tend to feel like the, the awareness for women's sports and the celebration of women's sports goes up so much during the Olympics because there's just so much visibility. So I'd love if you could share a little bit more about your experience, what that was like, and um, maybe anything, any lessons or takeaways that you have from your experiences competing. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, The first Olympics is definitely, in my opinion, the best because you're experiencing everything for the first time. And obviously when you go to the second and third or fourth or fifth, those lucky people, you you're experiencing a different country or, you know, different atmosphere. So it's always new to a degree. Um, but Vancouver was eyes wide open for me. My dream came true. Um, my parents were able to be there and celebrate it and just support. Um, so it was incredible. And it was in Vancouver, Canada. Um, so our biggest rivals, they're on their home soil. And all we want to do is, you know, hopefully, you know, beat each team, leading up to that gold medal game. But like I said, it it was a great experience. The opening ceremonies, in my opinion, the best part of it all. Um, And then, you know, you lose. So you either win or lose. And I think that that changes your mindset leading into your next four years, right? And so with that loss, it kind of translated to the 2014 second Olympics that I had of you know, all business. Right. So I felt like I didn't enjoy Sochi as much because we just wanted to come away with a gold medal. And I do believe that, you know, we decisions were made um, regretfully, like we didn't go to the opening ceremonies in 2014. And as someone who was already there, it's like, oh, okay, but you got to really look at the other girls that it's their first time. And it's such an unforgettable moment. I don't care if you have a game or a match the next day you go to the opening ceremonies, even if it's for an hour. Um, It's just something that you'll never forget. Um, And so we did go because we experienced not going. So we did go in 2018. Um, But yeah, all business 2014 uh, lost again. So that was the most heartbreaking loss of my entire journey, my entire career. Um, We were winning the game with three minutes left. So thinking, you know, your dream is right there and it's just completely taken away from you. Um, But only the fault of us, right? Because it was all mindset and we just weren't prepared for those last three minutes of the game. Um, So that 2014 to 2018 was a real game changer for our program um, just because we changed everything uh, from the mental skills that we were doing to how we trained, how we ate, how we slept, any single thing that we could do to improve just that 1%, we were going to do it. Um, because we didn't want to go into 2018 with any regrets. And, you know, we did that. Yeah. yeah, there were some ups and downs along the way. There were a lot of bumps and bruises, some challenges. But 
I think when you look at it as a whole and you, you know, you, you fight that much and you go through some of the hardest days of your entire life, but you come out with a gold medal. Um, yeah, I'd say it's worth it, but definitely a lot of learning experience throughout and, um, just be able to represent your country, right? Olympics, what we're talking about the whole world, the way the world is right now, it's unbelievable. I'm so glad that we still have the Olympics that we have because everyone just comes together and everybody's united. And it's just a beautiful thing that we can do for three weeks and just, you know, celebrate sport and celebrate everyone that works so hard for it. Agreed. Mic drop moment there that, yeah, that is so true. Just, I just keep saying this, but like, that's an amazing story of you guys using those, those losses and having to reflect on those for the next four years and think, how are we going to level up for the next, for our next go? And just making those changes between Sochi and the next Olympics where you won gold, uh, I guess, was that something that the team decided on right away? It's like what we've been doing isn't working or hasn't fully prepared us to finish? Or how did you guys decide to make those changes and implement those to help you level up for the next the next go. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, we have a lot of team behind the team when it comes to the national team. So we have our GM, we obviously have our coaches. um, And I feel like I've had about nine different coaches with the national team. So, you know, you're never comfortable, Um, you know, leading up to 2018, we had a coach, uh, Ken Klee, who was unbelievable. We won every single tournament. Uh, We were an amazing incredibly talented team and he was cut right before the 2017 uh world championship so it it was a a big adjustment i think for us and it was kind of like a shock um but it was a decision that our gm made and i think as a leader as a player you have to trust those decisions and it's like okay how can we rally the team okay this happened let's move on we have a goal in front of us a year away we have to reach it and it's it's very tough being a leader um, at the at the highest level, but you do whatever you can to try to rally the troops and understand that we are playing for something bigger than ourselves. Every single day when you wake up, um, you know, you want to be motivated. And every single day when you go to bed, you want to be satisfied that you did everything that you could to get better that day. Yeah, I that made me think of something that our candidates at shift group are going through uh leaving their athletic career or their military career behind i think they're seeking mentorship and they're seeking leadership or um trying to trust the process for their next role really when they're going through this huge transition in their life so i'm just curious if you would have any advice for candidates like this who are going through this transition how would you encourage them to lean into the process and find a leader or a mentor within their organization that's completely new to them? Yeah, I mean, always follow your heart in whatever you're doing. Always stay authentic to you. And, you know, only join something if you completely believe in it, you believe in the people that are on board and that are behind it. Um, because then if you do it just for the money sake, um, you probably will be in it a few months and not be happy, you know. I think me retiring, I, I enjoyed retirement a lot at the beginning, but then there came a phase where it was like, I felt like I lost my identity a little bit because I wasn't training like I was. And I was such, you know, someone who worked out so hard and I always thought, okay, whatever I want to do next, I want to love it. And I want to love where I'm at and I want to make sure my heart is full. So anything that I do, whatever decision I make, I just try to, you know, follow my heart instead of my brain. Yes. That is huge. I think so many of us lean into the logic and while that is important, don't get me wrong. It's, Mm -hmm. it is, sometimes it is the feeling. That's one thing that I've had to struggle with transitioning out of sport, but in my professional career, if it doesn't feel right, for me, that's how I typically know if it's going to be a good path for me. And I've learned to lean into right. that. But it took a lot of trial and error. Yep. hundred percent. And like, I, yeah, we, we could be probably making a lot more money with other decisions that we make, but I look at, you know, my family, I look at where my home is, what am I surrounded by? I know what I enjoy in my day to day life. And those are the, that's how I make my decision. And it's as simple as that. Yeah. I, I'm right there with you. And and on that identity piece, struggling with the identity post-sport, 
a lot of candidates I work with are struggling with that. I struggled with that for a long time. What, how did you, I mean, I know you follow your heart. Is there any other advice you have for overcoming that, that battle with identity or what helped you get through it? Yeah. I mean, I always look at kind of just kind of separating things. Okay. What, what do you want to do next? Oh, people say, I don't know what my passion is. Okay. Well, what are some of the things that you love? What are the, some of the things that you even like genuinely want to get interested in kind of, you know, get your feet wet in something and just try it. Right. Don't kind of pro procrastinate it because you just don't know what you want to do. Um, if you want to influence the youth, influence the youth. If you want to, you know, be a social media producer, try and do that. Like get your hands wet in, in little things. And I think that over time, you're, you're going to find your niche, your niche, however people say it. Um, yeah. But for me, it's like, start simple, like set a goal and then set small girl goals in order to work towards that. And then it's just like every single day you wake up and you have your routine, you have, you know, your habits. And I think that if you just simplify things and, and go towards it in that manner, then, you know, you're going to find your path no matter what. And I've always just stayed true to that. And that's how hockey was for me. Right. I had, you know, I want to be an Olympian or I want to win a gold medal. Okay. Well, what do I have to do to get better every single day and do it consistently? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like it's kind of a battle too every day with the, the athlete side of us that has a bit of perfectionism in us, but then also not being afraid to fail because you, right. You need to fail to figure it out or you're just going yep. to be spinning wheels and, and staying in a safe place, a safe, unhappy place. <laughs> so. No, for sure. And I look at that. I look at people probably look at my resume and said, Oh, she succeeded with everything she did in life. Well, it was kind of the total opposite. I succeeded when I won a gold medal for sure. And my nine world championships, but I lost two Olympic gold medals. I um, lost a world championship on home soil. I lost in the frozen four at UNH. Um, there were a lot of things that I felt I got cut from the team. You know, I had a lot of stern talking to about kind of sometimes my, my work ethic in the beginning of my career, but those are the things that kind of taught me how to, you know, be a great leader and, you know, someone who, you know, can be a great role model for kids. And I feel like the failures that we go through in life set you up for, you know, comebacks that you never thought that you could handle before. And it just becomes an amazing story, but you have to go through them and, you know, you yeah. have to set an action plan and, you know, be consistent. Like I said, every single day. Yeah. It's so, it, it's so awesome to see behind the curtain. Like you just laid that out. Like, yes, I've succeeded, but look at all the things I failed at that gave me the opportunity to succeed and have the amazing story. But nobody talks about those failure moments that it's all about the accolade. And so we really, when you really pull the curtain back, it's like Casey did just fall into success. She had to work really hard for it. And there were failures yeah. along the way that she allowed herself to make. Yeah. Yeah. So I just, yeah, it's so cool. I do want to touch on, um, I know we're running short on time and I hate that. <laughs> so I want to touch a little bit on what you do currently at Maples Crossing. You're the director of athletic development. What does that mean? What are you doing for them? Yeah. So Long story short, um, a development company I really work for kind of approached me. They bought this entire 70 acres of land. It was supposed to be hockey rinks. Um, so when I took the job, it was supposed to be like four hockey rinks and I was going to run, you know, the programs out of there. But with COVID and everything financially, um, it kind of took a sidestep. So now it's, it's still an athletic complex, but it's a big turf field with a permanent dome over it. And then a practice field. We have an uh, e-games room, concessions, vending, but I kind of handle booking the turf and, you know, working with our groups that come in. I do a lot of strength sessions with our field hockey uh, and lacrosse clinics. Um, and right now I'm getting into implementing, um, kind of a mindset class it's called gold mind and just the things that i learned throughout my career i want to implement into these middle school and high school ages um and then trying to do some off ice training once that dome comes because with the weather it's very hard to transfer all the equipment in there so we're moving here um we're under construction a little bit but 
I always Same. wanted to influence the youth, right? That was my biggest thing. Um, I thought about getting involved with the new women's league, but I think I want to wait until I see it develop a little more because I, I really love where I'm at. I love being able to, like I said, influence the youth because this generation, as they come up, you know, we've seen it change a lot and, you know, how these kids are. And if we can just put these, you know, little um, nuances in their minds about working hard and having a great mindset and having confidence and having a positive attitude, the more they hear that, the better off they're going to be once they hit, you know, high school and beyond. Yeah. I think the commitment to mental fitness is so, I, I just love that this is a common thing now when I was playing, it was, it was just becoming a thing into the space. Hey, mental fitness, uh, psych psych psychology coaches like it just was yeah. new so it's amazing that this is becoming the norm for the next generation of athletes as it should be yep totally i think when i first got involved with the mindset piece of it i was like what is this this is weird this this isn't cool no one's doing this but then <laughs> you start to implement it and you see the changes not just on the ice but on in your day-to-day -day. um Confidence is such a huge piece of everybody that I think it's lacking in the youth right now. I think there's a lot of, you know, bullying going on and a lot of comparison these days because of social media that yeah. it's, it's, a, it's sad, but I think instead of complaining about it, be the, be the difference, right? Be the change. And that's kind of what I'm striving for right now. I love that. It's not going anywhere. So we have to work with it and figure out how to make the best of the situation. Um, exactly. I, I hate that we're short on time. I have so many more questions that I want to ask you. So I'll just wrap it up with this one last question. Okay. Um, we, as athletes, we sometimes forget that there's so much more to us. We get really tied up in our identity as athletes. So I just want to know, Casey, what fills your cup outside of hockey and your current gig? Uh, my family. Um, I love love. All my teammates would attest to that. Um, I think I have a very like, you know, soft, soft heart, uh, even though I was very much of a hard ass on the ice, but <laughs> just, just, you know, the little things in life, right? Like going for long walks uh, outside with our dog, um, having deep conversation, um, you know, working out, so love to do that. But it's just, you know, being away, being around the people that fill your cup uh, is the most important thing to me. And um, since retiring, I've been able to spend a lot more time with family. Um, and then losing a few of my grandparents of late, you know, it, it opened your eyes to the importance of being around the people that you really truly want to be around. Um, and those are the, those are the things and those are the people that fill my cup. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time, Casey. I really appreciate it. This was an awesome conversation and, um, I know our listeners have found so much value in this. So I, I, I appreciate it. Can I encourage anyone to connect with you on LinkedIn? Definitely. Yep. Yep. Casey Bellamy right on there. Um, and if we ever want to take this forward and get deeper, I'm more than happy to. I love that. I'm going to take you up on that in the future for sure. Definitely. Thank you so much, Casey. Thanks, Jordan.